All right. Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Paul Rangel. I'm the chair for the Transportation, Public Safety, and Environment Committee here for Manhattan Community Board 3. It is 6.33 on Tuesday, February 9, 2021. Uh, we do have a unique agenda tonight. Uh, it's going to start with a joint committee item um, with, the transport with Health and Human Services. Uh, they are on the call as well tonight. They are sharing one item with us tonight. Um, and then we'll go into the regular agenda for the remainder of the Transportation Committee meeting. Um, that being said, I'm, I'm going to ask the Transportation Committee and Transportation Committee only, is there any objections to the minutes from the January meeting? Oh, I love the sound of silence. That's great. So, Wendy, can you please uh, start with our attendance for right now? for oh, transportation. Uh, okay. Yes, present. Uh, Michelle Cooper-Smith? Present, yes. Wendy Lee, secretary? Yes. Lee Berman? Yes. David Crane? Yes. Felicia Kirkshank? I don't see her on. Okay. Ellen Lowe? Yes. Tariq Ramos? Tariq? Uh, I don't see Tariq, no. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, May, uh, so that concludes our first item, which is approval of minutes. Um, I believe we also have to do the human services vote. You, you are supposed uh, to do it the other way. I'm going to do it. That's I'm, okay. I'm, I'm going to do it right now. Do you want to do it or you want me to do it? No, I meant you were supposed to do your minutes later because it's not part of this meeting. Um, but it's okay. Uh, <laughs> That happens. I'm right, sorry. isn't it, Susan? Isn't that true? Yes, you're absolutely right. I went, I went out of order. <laughs> sorry. You're absolutely oh. right, and it wasn't me catching it. <laughs> That's on me. I'm sorry. I was so anxious to get it done. But, uh, um, okay, I will call the attendance. Uh, I'll, I'll just wait one minute. I'll get the thing out. Okay, so I'm calling the attendance for the uh, health and for the health human services committee. Uh, May, I'm here. Thomas, Rosa, here. Uh, Larissa Shaneberg, Larissa, she's on. Okay, David Crane. David? Oh, there he is. Okay. Yes. Sorry. Eric Diaz. Oh, Shirley Fennessy. Uh, Deborah Glass. Yeah, I, I can't see everything right now. Um, Deborah Glass. Deborah's on. I see her on. Tatiana Jorio. Yes. Paul Rangel. Yes. Heidi Schmidt. Yes. Ricky Wong. Carmen Perez. Present. Okay. Eric is. Deborah Glass, you say she's on. And Larissa, Ricky. Okay, well, we'll see if they come later. All right, um, thank you. So this is a joint committee item between transportation and Oh, Shirley, Shirley does sign in. Wanna try her again? Okay, Shirley Fennessy. I'm here, sorry, I couldn't find my mute. 
I'm here, folks. All right. Thank you. Okay, we can go ahead. So this is a joint committee item between Human Services and Transportation Committee. It's, um, I believe the member president has asked us to ask this to be a joint, a joint item. Um, it revolves the exonerated five, um, uh, I'm drawing a blank on the word, but all I know is our colleagues from Community Board 10 are here to present on. So I believe Karen Horry is on. Yes, I'm here. Karen, the um, floor is all yours. Yes, I think our chair would like to say something before I begin. Oh, sure, go right ahead. Hello, everyone. My name is Cicely Harris. I'm the chair of Community Board 10. Um, thank you so much for having us. Thank you, um, Chairperson Alicia Lewis Coleman, Paul Rangel, uh, May Lee, uh, Susan. Uh, good to see you again. I see you on all these uh, test and tracing <laughs> calls that we have. Um, so uh, again, thank you so much for having us. Um, as you said, Paul, this is a borough-wide initiative. It did start out as you know a CB10 thing that we were just envisioning in our area, but when we took it to um, borough board just to discuss what we were doing, it was important that you know, and Madam Borough President saw this as well that we use this opportunity to have a real conversation about social justice, um, especially you know in in times like these. It's important that we one you know unite together and discuss these issues. Um, and in a place so uh, known, well known and loved as Central Park, um, this could also serve as a gateway for that conversation, as a gateway for healing in that conversation, especially for so many people for so long that felt disenfranchised and could not go safely into that park or felt that they would be demonized in that space. Um, so it was it's really important that we have these conversations um, and we have, uh, I think you're our second to last board. So we've been doing these uh, uh, presentations all around. Um, and we just thank you for receiving us tonight. And if you have any questions or concerns, I'll be here. Um, but I really do want to thank Karen, Ori, and her team, Chanel Washington, and our board for coming up with this presentation, coming up with this idea, and just seeing it through. Um, so Karen, thank you. You're muted. Thank you, Cicely. I hope I'm not having a problem. My grandchildren were homeschooling today and the computer's been acting a little weird, but hopefully everything will go well. But thank you everyone. And I appreciate your uh, scheduling us for this opportunity to present. And with that, I'd like to share my screen and begin the presentation. You should, you should be able to share right now, Karen. I'm not seeing where she was made co-host. Yeah, but she has the ability to share, oh, so. okay. If you can share, you can send us the document and one of us can share it. Yeah. I, I don't know if she lost her connection or not. Karen, are you there? She warned us. Uh, it looks like Cicely is calling her, so. Okay. <laughs> there she is. Oh, I see that Ricky Wong is here now. Uh, I believe Deborah is on. She was having an issue with her audio. Okay. 
Cam, you want to just take yourself off mute? Or is it not working? There we go. She's still muted. Yeah. I think she's having issues with her connection. What a gorgeous photograph. Um, she says, um, can you unmute her from your end, Paul or, or Susan? I'm going to try. Let me see. I can only ask her to unmute. That's all I can do right now. Some reason she can't access any of the controls. Do you, do you want to send it to us and we'll play it for you? Karen, hold on. If she went into full screen. Can you hear her now? Karen, speak. Yes, hello? Yes. Did you hear her then? It's just too much feedback on her end. Okay, let me try. Let me go out again. Let me stop sharing. Stop sharing. Stop sharing. Maybe she can dial in, Paul. I'd like you to unmute. unmute. Oh, now you're unmuted. I'm, un I'm unmuted now. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes, yeah. we can hear you. Okay. All right, let me turn this off. Okay, let me try one more time. I'm not muted. I'm still stop. Okay, share screen. Screen. Start broadcast. Go to. Uh, here. And can everyone see the screen? Can you hear me? Yeah, there you go. Yeah, there we go. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Oh, great. Okay, let me get started before anything else happens. Okay, so um, this evening we'd like to, the Community Board 10 would like to present our um, proposal to commemorate the Exonerated Five and social justice reform inside of Central Park. So our mission is to create an exhibit an exhibition of a permanent parks and recreation educational commemoration to honor the exonerated five and social justice reform by April 2022, which would be the 20th anniversary of the exoneration of the group. Um, we also would like to raise awareness through this exhibit, awareness and sensitivity to a systemic and institutionalized pattern of racial injustice and the need for reform. Public art has the power over time to transform and uplift social consciousness. We envision a city with successful and engaging public spaces where citizens and visitors alike will encounter a work of art, of public art, that is not only captivating, but conscience raising as well. We envision a permanent commemoration to the fortitude and resiliency of the five men known as the exonerated five and to the need for social justice reform. We propose a commemorative permanent art piece cited in the Northeast section of Central Park that celebrates the, the extraordinary diversity and history of our community while pointing to the city's aspirations for the future. We um, seek to increase language around the spur of advocacy. 
Um, so the events surrounding the exonerated five and its impact on the community, this is basically our resolution, but I'll just um, share the first paragraph for five young boys who hailed from the Harlem area adjacent to the northern end of the park near 110th Street. Central Park loomed as a rural oasis in the midst of the urban concrete. Their access was limited by the algae dominated mirror at the time and dilapidated facilities, uh, which was not the norm for the more affluent areas of the park. But nevertheless, these young boys viewed the park as their backyard. On April 19th, 1989, these boys would experience the onset of an unimaginable, unimaginable blight in their young lives that no one should have to ever endure. The high profile case brought to the light the prevalence of racial profiling, discrimination, and inequality in the media and legal system. So this is just basically our um, resolution. Um, this horrific event had impact on the families and this is a statement from Mrs. Um, Sharon Salam, where she shares that the climate took its toll on all our families, destroying relationships between father and son and mother and son. The many years of stress on our innocent boys and families caused many family members to be inflicted with disease and driven even to death. In 2003, Matias Reyes stepped out of the shadows and confessed to raping the jogger, um, Patricia Maley. His DNA supported his confession. Now that the prison experience is over, we are all trying to move toward forgiveness while we are building our lives. The, the story of the exonerated five continues to be told throughout uh, through acclaimed storytellers in print, film, and TV. Um, there is a, a riveting in-depth biographical account of, uh, of the notorious event, um, uh, uh, which is, uh, was directed by Sarah Burns, filmmaker Sarah Burns, um, along with um, her father, Ken Burns and David McMahon. Um, the uh, Central Park Five is the name of the documentary. Um, uh, Sarah Burns also wrote a book on the topic, the Central Park Five. Uh, their story um, has appeared in When They See Us, award-winning um, Netflix miniseries. Um, created, co-written, and directed by Ava DuVernay. Um, and then there is um, Oprah Winfrey Presents, When They See Us Now, which is a companion special um, to When They See It, to, to the uh, miniseries featured on Netflix. So the, uh, it has, this, there has been a, 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 a plethora of, of, um, of uh, documentation around this issue and, and recognition. Why an, an in-park commemoration? A commemoration to the exonerated five in Central Park would be uh, designed to shed light on the prejudice, hatred, and ultimately unnecessary incarcerations that occur due to the inequities inherent in the American justice system. Um, to commemorate in the park would be an opportunity to inform, engage, and activate the public in building a path to healing for Black and Latinx communities in Harlem, um, the nation, and throughout the world. So, and we also um, can begin to look at and, and begin to advocate and begin to implement um, processes which would uh, do away with mass incarceration based on racism and um, the uh, very prevalent school to prison pipeline that exists. African-Americans make up approximately 13% of the American population, but roughly 36% of the 2.2 million Americans incarcerated. About one in nine black men between the ages of 22 and 34 years old are in prison. New York City's communities of color are disproportionately impacted by incarceration. Youth of color remain far more likely to be committed than white youth. Between 2003 and 2013, the racial gap between black and white youth in secure commitment facilities increased by 15%. High imprisonment rates correlate with other community problems related to poverty, employment, education, and health. And this inequitable disparity has been made even more evident as a result of the ravages of COVID-19. Improvements made to the northern end of the park began in 1989, following the Central Park Jogger case. Work on the ravine located in the northern part of the park was completed by 1992. The Central Park Conservancy announced a $51 million campaign for upgrades in 1993, resulting in the restoration of 
uh, the Bridal Trails, the Mall, the Harlem Mirror, the Northwoods, and the construction of the Dana Discovery Center at the Harlem Mirror. An in, an, in, an in park commemoration will present a forum to raise conscious awareness around the need for social and criminal justice reform, a gross miscarriage of justice that forever brutally altered the lives of five young boys from the community who formerly saw the north end of Central Park as their backyard. And in the in park commemoration would encapsulate a return to the site of origin of the miscarriage of justice, in a sense, coming full circle. This would be an added component in the promulgation of an iconic healing of systemic wounds on a much broader societal level. The park is the most natural location for a commemoration since its location is burned into the collective memories of New Yorkers as a major turning point in our city's history. The objectives of, of an in-park commemoration would include honoring the resiliency and experiences of the exonerated five, bringing attention to the pervasiveness of racial injustice within a criminal justice system with special attention to the experiences of young people of color. This would uh, also be designed to shift commemoration activities in public spaces um, to other than civil war heroes um, or, or um, um, to now to victims of racial injustice, changing the narrative of who is honored to embrace all corners of our city and sharing the lived experience, the lived experiences of people who are victimized by the criminal justice system and demonstrating that this is not an isolated injustice, but part of a larger system that produces injustice in daily ways. While this touches on advocacy, showing the role of the exonerated five and shifting criminal justice policy in New York state, the exonerated five were involved in pushing along with the Innocence Project legislation that now requires that all inter interrogations be electronically recorded and, and now working in, on a bill that would ban the use of police deception in the interrogation room. Four key audience segments the exhibit seeks to engage would be the local area residents, the black and brown communities of the, at the northern end of the park that have been generationally impacted by mass incarceration and the economic and social disparages that collectively affect them. Um, and, and, and also the affluent communities surrounding Central Park as well. Uh, the 42 million visitors who visit Central Park each year. Um, this would be a, uh, an opportunity to, to connect with the diverse local, national, and international general public. Uh, the media, and um, in working with the, in, in uh, uh, addressing and engaging the media, we would like to help them to acknowledge their past sins in connection with this particular case and to reimagine how they report about largely black and brown criminal defendants so that they embrace the presumption of innocence um, in their coverage as opposed to just um, automatic guilt. Also an opportunity to work with them to rewrite the story through what we hope will be a new and different lens that respects innocence. And last but not least, the youth. En engaging the youth community, teaching them about the scourge of wrongful convictions, about how racism defeats the presumption of innocence and helping them to be engaged in social change so that they can become um, uh, active in their communities and a part of decisions that affect them. Desired takeaways for visitors um, from the Empire commemoration would include the reflection on the human cost of systemic racism and, and exploring the roles and responsibilities of individuals, society, and government when confronting racism, injustice, and institutionalized inequities. And also to educate the public school, I'm sorry, to educate the public about what led to the conviction and subsequent exoneration of the Central Park Five, including the historical context about policing in, the New, York, in, in New York City at that time and what is going on today. So again, we would like to um, engage the uh, media and um, have them become um, responsible in their reporting techniques. At this point, the exhibit, the permanent exhibit is anomalous. Um, we um, have had discussions um, and we, real, we um, have discussed the fact that we need to have a, um, a public art process, um, pro public art selection process. So um, these are just some of the um, uh, suggestions, suggestions that um, were derived from our conversations, but we realized that we, we would have to do a selection, an art selection process. And, and it would, would, would be a public process.
The presumption of innocence was totally disregarded and the imprisonment ordeal and subsequent family suffering should be designed to be a powerful but palatable part of this um, viewing experience. Um, the blatant racism should be graphically exemplified with Donald Trump's full page ads in the media as part of the middle section of this exhibit or somewhere in, in, in included in, 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 uh, within the exhibit. So again, our, um, one of our main goals is to educate. So um, we can use this, we, uh, we would like for the exhibit to be interactive um, and be a, um, an opportunity for education again and conscience aware, uh, uh, raising awareness for the um, public. An exonerated five commemoration could be linked to uh, programs such as the Seneca Village um, Central Park commemoration, which is temporary at this time, but we are working towards its permanence. Um, it is currently an exhibit in Central Park, and it um, uh, is a um, an example of social injustice. It was a village um, of uh, a thriving village of pre predominantly African Americans, um, which was raised um, in, in 1857 having been founded in 1825 to make way for Central Park and uh, people who were there um, were um, displaced as a result. Um, also the women's suffrage monument can be tied in. Ida B. Wells, who was a, um, I'm sorry, who was a uh, women's suffragette, um, was very much involved with anti-lynching advocacy at the beginning of the century, the, the uh, 20th century. Um, and we're, we're at that time, there were thousands, people being lynched in the thousands, um, predominantly people of color. Um, the Marion J. Sims statue is whatever that replacement is going to be, um, which would, if it's, if it's related to the whole issue with the medical apartheid and Marion J. Sims, where he used um, uh, black women who were enslaved as to experiment on for his gynecological procedures, not using any anesthesia and then um, taking those same techniques and using them on white women while using anesthesia. Um, the New York Historical Society has a, an exhibit on slavery in, um, in New York, which is another uh, uh, powerful example of social injustice um, that uh, could be related, related to this exhibit. And then there's the Rikers Public Memory Project. Um, this is a community-based initiative involving collective stories about the impact of Rikers, the Riker family purchased the island in 1864 and over a 200 year period engaged in profiteering from the slave trade in the New York City area. Slavery ended in 1827 in the state of New York and New York City purchased the, the island in 1884. The Rikers Island Jail opened in 1932 and has been notorious for overcrowding, violence, abuse, substandard and inhuman condition, inhumane conditions. Um, and the Rikers Memory Pro Public Project is advocating for its closure. So this project is um, extremely well supported. We have been visiting uh, the, all of the boards across Manhattan. Um, we have visited all of the surrounding boards getting either letters of, of, of uh, support or um, resolutions. Um, we even have a letter of support from Senator Chuck Schumer and, uh, and our elected officials and, um, and uh, so we, 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 and, and we're just, we have trem had, had tremendous support from the borough president. Um, and um, uh, this, this, is a, this is an extremely vital project, which is well supported, I just like to say. So additional advocacy would be, um, around advocacy would be in, uh, advocating for legislation. Um, ending unnecessary jail detention for people awaiting trial and for low level offenses, shortening excessive prison sentences and improving release processes, sen sentencing fewer people to incarceration and making sentences shorter, changing the financial incentives that fuel punitive justice system responses, stopping probation and parole uh, systems from fueling incarceration, keeping juvenile justice, criminal justice, and immigration processes separate, giving all communities a voice in how our justice system works, and examining how we, um, the, the whole process of punishment versus rehabilitation. So as a part of our um, vetting of this issue, um, we had extensive meetings in committee. Um, 
we uh, had over the summer three um, public forums um, to discuss the, the, the issues surrounding um, this commemoration. Um, and these are some of our panelists, Sarah Burns, filmmaker, Malik Yoba, actor, author, and activist, Dr. Youssef Salam, a member of the Exonerated Five, Mrs. Sharon Salam, uh, Dr. Salam's mother and co-founder of Justice for the Wrongfully Incarcerated, um, Jay Larry, a corporate uh, lawyer, uh, Ricardo Barreto, uh, independent cultural community consultant specializing in public art processes, Cynthia Copeland, president of the Institute for the Exploration of Seneca Village History, Vincent Sutherland, executive director, NYU Center on Race, Inequality, and the Law. Rebecca Brown, director of Pol policy for the Innocence Project, Dr. Adamola Alugbafola, um, vice president um, for International Communications Association and ha the Harlem Dwyer Cultural Center. Brenda Berkman, retired uh, FDNY captain and director of the Monumental Women Board of Directors. Myself, Karen Ori, and Isaiah Jenkins, um, Manhattan Borough Director, Office of Mayor de Blasio. So, as, as I said, we vetted this issue very um, thoroughly on October 2nd. Uh, 2019 and our, it was the uh, request to commemorate was first voiced at our general board meeting on that date. Um, subsequent to that, um, the we had uh, committee meetings on December 11th of 2019, January 22nd of 2020, February 12th of 2020, March 11th of 2020, April 8th of 2020 and May 26th of 2020. Um, on March 25th, um, we received our uh, Parks and Recreation Committee received authorization from our executive committee to form a subcommittee to um, address this issue. Uh, as, and then on June 18th, um, the board unanimously passed a, I'm sorry, on June 3rd, Community Board 10 unanimously passed a resolution in support of the, the, uh, the project on July 30th. Uh, was the um, was the I'm sorry Ju Ju the subcommittee which was formed met on June 18th, July 9th, and July 30th, um, and we've uh, solicited facts and opinions on the New York on New York City's Art in the Parks program and its policies and projects. Um, we developed a focus group. Um, I'm sorry, the focus groups were held in the summer. Those were the uh, discussion groups and they were held on July 9th, July 16th and July 23rd. Um, the subcom subcommittee formed a walkthrough group consisting of subcommittee members. Um, the group met on uh, August 13th and August 15th. They did a walkthrough. Uh, they also developed a selection criteria was that the route that the commemoration should take should be installed somewhere along the route that people would that the exonerated five would have entered the park in 1989 um, and that it should be accessible for all park visitors and that the site uh, should be as least intrusive to the integrity of the park setting and respective of the central park mission um, the site that was suggested was 110th street and fifth and fifth avenue at, which is an entrance um, <coughs> that uh, the group selected and thought felt would be a um, ideal site for commemoration. So um, in terms of our next steps, um, we submitted a statement of, we developed and submitted a statement of objectives and goals on October 23rd to uh, Central Park Conservancy and New York City Parks. Um, our meeting was facilitated by the mayor's, the mayor's office. So, um, we have received, we've received feedback, I believe on January 12th, um, and uh, we are taking next steps. So I uh, would like to thank everyone for your patience, and I will conclude my presentation at this time and uh, uh, take questions uh, at this time. So I'd like to stop screen sharing. Um, let me see if I can do that. There you go. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Karen. Uh, so, uh, 
in the interest of time, I know uh, our colleagues from CB10 have another presentation to do at 7.30. So for the committee, uh, any questions for Karen or for Cicely, I, if you're taking questions as well, um, just raise your hands and we'll go from there. I have a question, but I can't figure out how to raise my hand. That's all right. Go ahead, Heidi. Um, I just wanted to know, you mentioned Yusuf, um, and I wanted to know if the others were involved in either recommending this or during the process, and if they're at the table um, to kind of direct, if they want to be at the table to direct um, the process. Well, it's primarily been Yusuf who has been um, in, involved in this process. Um, at our last meeting, we had the attorney for Corey Wise present. Um, uh, so to date, it's been um, Yousef and now Corey Wise who has sent representation to the meeting. We're hoping to um, uh, have the other three at the table as well. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, this is for both committees, transportation, and for human services. Whoever wants to ask a question, this will be the time. I do want to be respectful of uh, CB10's time before they have to go to their next presentation. Can I just ask one other question? Sure. Go ahead, Heidi. I don't know how the rest of the committee feels about everything, but I just am like really excited about this. I think it's it sounds fantastic, and it's like the fact that suffragettes you know, um, monument is now there. It really changes the conversation. I'm actually getting emotional just thinking about it. Um, but I'm like really excited about it. And it's, um, I would think it's a huge step in the right direction. And, um, you know, I'm supportive and I just, I'm excited. I just wanted to express that. Thank you. Awesome. Right, and I did have a question. My question was, is there any other, um, is there any other support or gaps that you're finding in your presentations? It sounds like there's a lot of people who are supportive. Is there anything else that I guess committee members can do to help you along? Um, at this time, uh, we are just uh, gathering the support from the community. Um, as I said, at a later time, we want to, we understand that this is a, is a, a um, a lengthy process. So um, we will need support all, all every step along the way. And um, we would, to, and in order to develop a permanent commemoration, we would like to have public input and um, have a public art process for that. So um, we just would, you know, would just like to have the support of the community all along the way as much as possible. I just want to say, I'm Shirley, I just want to say I, um, I also um, agree with Heidi. I mean, this is such an amazing thing. I love the idea that it's interactive and that it sparks conversations about racial injustice. And I, I really am so happy that you're doing this. I think it's fantastic. Thank you. Um, may you have your hand up? Yeah, so um, my question is, yeah, I noticed that there is a um, sort of a process to uh, compose whatever the display will be. There's like a, 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 there's some sort of a process, right? That's what I got in, in terms of what's gonna go into the commemoration, there's a process to collect the material or the art. Is that correct? Yes, there would be a oh, process. Okay. Right, so I'm mm -hmm. sure there'll be a big focus in terms of getting it i'm sure there'll be a big focus on you know um the the harlem area because that's where it's all centered but um are you seeking also um you know in terms of submissions or collections also more of a citywide um you know maybe from communities similar to harlem who are impacted by these issues um i think or is that, that would too be big? <laughs> um at this point i would say no it's not too big i mean we um, there might be some suggestion that um, the artists come from the area of the community where um, these young men came from, um, but this is a this is a this is a, a a national issue. This is an international issue. It's a global issue. So um, 
you know, I would think that, you know, as we go along with the process that uh, we would be receptive to um, the best representation that we can possibly get for a okay. permanent commemoration. Yeah, I was just saying what else we could do to support besides passing the resolution. That's, that's why I ask. Well, we can always come back um, at a later time um, to um, ask for further support. Okay. David, I'm gonna take one more question, go right ahead and then we'll start probably potentially discussing the resolution. Well, it's not a question. It was a more of a comment and thank you. Uh, I was in my young twenties or my, whatever. I was in my twenties when this thing happened. It was uh, one of the most horrifying, horrifying things that, that I've ever seen in New York City, um, well, anywhere. Um, anyway, thank you for creating what's going to be a very powerful, impactful, um, you know, installation. It's gonna be very impactful for racial equity and it's extremely important. And I'm just blown away that you pretend was able to do it in the amount of time that you have created that proposal. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, um, Heidi, I'm not sure if that's your hand up or you're clapping. No, I'm clapping for David. Okay. Sure. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> does anybody want to move that resolution to the floor? That, we uh, move the draft resolution into the making of a resolution. I can share my screen. I have a second. Paul, can second. I make one comment about the reso? Go ahead, Susan. Um, this reso is basically the same as the other boards. Yeah, go ahead, Susan. What? I was yeah, going to say this reso is, I took it from the ones the other boards did. They're all going to borough board, I believe. The only thing I did is I um, changed where it said community board 10. I changed it to community board three supports uh, community board 10 because it is, you know, they're within their district. But all the, all the other text is the same as the other boards are doing. All right. Um... We do have the reso in front of us. Um, from bo both committees, any questions, anything you want to make changes on it? David, I believe you had some questions. Uh, I remember you shooting me over an email. Do you have something that you, you wanted to offer? About this one? I, yeah. I, I'm forgetting what I, what I wrote, Paul. Um, a little reminder, a word or two? I'm, I'm going to try. Hold on. Give me, let me, let me uh, find your email. Uh, I'm sure it was inconsequential. You know, like I could say this is going to be a borough board resolution. It was about the last whereas and the result clauses being two different things. It's really yeah. not clear. So it really is inconsequential. They just see, I was just wondering what the distinction was between the two, but we don't need to wonder much about it. It's a it's a great resolution for a, supporting a great project. Okay. Um, any of the committees, tra transportation or health and human services, uh, have any questions or want to offer any amendments? If, if not, I believe we can move this to a vote. All right, let's move, um, let's move this to a vote. Wendy, you can uh, call out for transportation, please. Uh, just the vote for transportation, right? Yeah, just for transportation, just for us. Or... Mm -hmm. uh, Paul just... Ranko? Yes. Oh. Is that... Yeah. Uh, this is just on this resolution, so this is uh, yes for me. Michelle? Yes. Wendy, yes. Lee Berman? Yes. David? Yes. Felicia? She's not out. Okay. Helen? <clears throat> yes. 
and Tariq. Tariq? Tariq's not on, no. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, and May, uh, however you want to do it for your committee. May or Thomas, I'm not sure who's going to do it. Oh, Thomas? Uh, can someone unshare their screen? Okay. I don't hear it, Thomas. Okay, I will give call. I will do the roll call. David Crane? Yes. Thomas Rosa? Yes. Shirley Fennessy? Yes. Deborah Glass? Yes. Uh, Ricky Wong? Yes. Larissa Shaneberg? No. Uh, Heidi Schmidt? Yes. Eric Diaz? May. Carmen Perez? Yes. Tatiana Jorio? Yes. Paul Rangel? Yes, squared. There you go. Okay, <laughs> great. Okay, so we have everybody. All right. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you to the uh, Human Services Committee for coming on and to our colleagues from Community Board 10. And uh, we hope to hear great things about this project in the future. Thank you for coming on and hope with 10 minutes to spare until your next presentation. Have a great one. Thank you. You too. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. You're All welcome. Right. Thanks, everybody. Yeah. Bye. Good night. Good night. Good night. Human services is always welcome to stay on. If not, have a good night and uh, we'll see you soon. Uh, you well, ciao. Thank you, thank you. All right, so I screwed up royally before and I went out of order. I apologize for that, but we're gonna go right to our next agenda item, which would be, um, we're gonna talk about the cameras. So, you know, we started talk, dabbling in it on our transportation issues last, month um, as we start taking little bits and pieces of uh, these issues apart. And I want to welcome Sam Vasquez on to the meeting, um, who's going to talk about uh, from uh, State Senator Hoylman's office about cameras. We do know it's a state thing and not a city thing. And how can this board, this uh, how can the city or this community board be of service and of assistance going forward? Thank you, Sam. Go ahead. Great. Thanks for having me. Uh, my name is Sam from Senator Hoylman's office. And, you know, I, I can start by just giving a brief rundown of a couple bills that Senator Hoylman has introduced on the issue of speed cameras. And then um, I'm happy to take any questions and kind of take the discussion uh, wherever you guys see fit. Um, so one of the bills that we've introduced recently is called the Furious Act, um, which stands for Fighting Underground, <laughs> Underground Racing in Our Streets Act. Um, so that, that came from the, um, a lot of constituent complaints that we had at, towards the beginning of the pandemic uh, about seeing street racing and hearing street racing at night, hearing the revving of the engines and things like that. And you know we, we got a lot of complaints, and then additionally we saw the data from the city that you know I think uh, let me pull up those numbers, but uh, between March 20th and September 10th there were over a thousand complaints to 311 about drag racing, which is uh, over five times the amount of complaints that um, took place in the same period the year before. So drag racing was blowing up in the city. And in large part, it was because of the open streets as folks uh, were driving less at the beginning of the pandemic. Um, so we, you know, we, we looked at the issue and we saw that the speed cameras that would be operating that that should be operating to catch folks that are racing and speeding like this uh, only operate during school hours. So, uh, well, that, that's defined from 10 a.m. to 6 p.m., I believe. And so a lot of the incidents that were occurring were not taking place during these hours, and so we're not being caught by the cameras. So our bill, um, the Furious Act, 
would authorize uh, community boards to activate these uh, speed cameras for during the overnight times. Um, so they would be 24 seven in cases of um, special concern where, where the community board can pass a resolution and uh, when, when they're concerned about racing and, and these kinds of dangerous behaviors, uh, and that would then trigger the 24-7 the speed cameras. Um, so that, that's one of our bills. Um, we, have, we have a few others on kind of street safety that we're working on at the moment. Um, one that would, instead of just this more targeted approach has, um, that would just is a blanket 24-7 speed camera bill, instead of you know having this more targeted racing and and uh, having to be triggered by the community board bringing, uh, passing a resolution and all that. There's, we have one that's just 24 seven speed cameras that's less targeted. And then uh, we also have another bill called Sammy's law that uh, allows um, the city to really have more full control over setting of speed limits. Uh, right now there's a, there's a minimum speed limit um, that uh, in state law and DOT and the city is limited by how low they can set their speed limit. There's, there's ways around it by having special uh, street calming measures and that would allow them special discretion to lower speed limits, but it's, it's a complicated process. So our bill um, would basically repeal that section that sets the, the, the minimum speed limit and allow uh, the city more discretion to, to have a more targeted approach. You know, some, sit, some streets um, need a lower speed limit. They have more incidents. They've had more, um, more crashes and, and injuries and deaths. And so uh, they, can, they can then use that data and, and lower speed limits based on what the city thinks is appropriate. And so that's called Sammy's Law, uh, named after a constituent that um, a young constituent that was hit by a car uh, in our district. So, and uh, it actually in the same place that a year later, another child was hit, but the speed limit had been lowered on that street and that, that child survived because of the lower speed limit. So that's, uh, that's something that we're also working on. Um, but those are, those are some of the things I know you guys had some other more broad questions and I'm, I'm happy to kind of talk about speed cameras more broadly if you guys um, are interested. And I can do what I can take. OK, th thanks, Sam. Um, before I entertain questions from uh, the committee, um, I, I just wanted to go back to something you just said on the Furious Act. Um, it's not there yet, right? It's being worked on? Or am I, am so I we, misreading that or mishearing that? We, we have legislation. Um, but it, um, we're working on getting support for it. Okay, and in that legislation, you said community boards would be able to activate these cameras? Uh, so to speak, it would be um, when, when these types of racing incidents occur, the, the cameras would be able to be activated for 24 seven um, by the community board passing a resolution. So basically, uh, the, if there are incidents happening in the community, the community board would then, uh, the, the legislation would ask that the community board have a hearing on the issues that are ha happening, the racing, and they could pass a resolution uh, that would then allow this, the cameras to be turned on overnight. I'm sorry, that, that was a little convoluted. Does that make sense? Like, uh, the I you could pass a resolution uh, if there's incidents, and then that would allow the cameras to be on 24 <laughs> seven. Cool, got it. I, I just wanted to make sure I heard that correctly. I was like, wait a yeah. minute, get to turn these things on? All right, <laughs> uh, hopefully hopefully that, that gets supported past at some point. Susan and then Dave, go ahead. Oh, still muted. Susan, you're on mute. I'm sorry, thank you. I have to comment, you can tell Brad was a 
former community board chair because he always includes community boards in his, in his legislation. That's, um, that's definitely true. The biggest thing I want to ask is um, my understanding is that the state caps the number of cameras and why, why does the state cap cameras for New York City? Why is an increase? This comes up at our budget consults a lot. Yeah. We want to ask for more money to be spent on cameras, but if the cameras aren't allowed by the state, we can't do that. So why doesn't the state allow us to have as many as we think sure. we need? And um, is the state's jurisdiction over cameras the same for different kinds of cameras? For instance, what about cameras that are not speed cameras, um, but put up say for uh, crime reasons or safety reasons? Sure, that's a good question. So the, um... I don't know exactly when this uh, when the speed cameras were authorized, but it was um, I think uh, during the Bloomberg era there was um, there was a, a state there was state authorizing legislation that uh, created a pilot program for speed cameras uh, that required the program to be reauthorized. I believe I believe every three years. And so when it was first created as a pilot program, it had, you know, it was, it was meant to be a test. So it had a limit on the number of cameras that would be used during this test. Um, then recently in 2009, um, we, uh, you know, there, there's kind of a, an understanding now that a lot of folks like speed cameras and we see that they have a, a really positive impact and they work. And so in 2009, we, uh, the state legislature greatly increased that, um, the cap. Uh, it, it, it basically, since these cameras can only be operated in, um, in school zones right now, it l increased the number of school zones that were in the program to 750 uh, school zones. And there's thousands of cameras um, total across the city. Um, so that, that was done in 2019 when the, when the underlying legislation had to be reauthorized. And that's typically how these kinds of, of programs usually work. I think the next reauthorization is in next year in 2022. And so we kind of see that as typically when kind of wider reaching, um, broader, expansions of the program take place. That's kind of why we took this more targeted approach uh, to, to expand the use of speed cameras uh, so that we can get that passed more, more quickly uh, by through this more targeted Furious Act. Um, and, you know, we, Senator Grenardis, uh, he carried the legislation to, who's a, one of uh, Brad's colleagues, carry the legislation to expand uh, and lift the cap on uh, on speed cameras in 2019. And so we, we, you know, we defer to him a little bit since he's kind of taken leadership on that, on that. And, um, but we definitely agree. In, in general, we, we, Brad tends to think that, you know, more home rule and local control of these kinds of things are, are appropriate. Um, that's why we introduced Sammy's law to allow the city to set its own speed limits. And that's why we're introducing Furious Act. And then the, the less targeted, just blanket 24 seven speed cameras. Um, you know, we, we tend to think that the Furious Act might have an easier time passing more quickly. That's why we took that more targeted approach. But we also think that it's worth considering just the blanket 24 seven bill, uh, because we do agree that this, you know, the community deserves more, should have more control over these types of things. So that's kind of where, where we're at. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm going to go to David and I know Michelle can't put her hand up. So I'll go to David. And then... um, I suppose I appreciate, you know, including community boards, but well, let's just say you, um, you know, you said that the community board could turn it on for an area of concern. Well, my area of concern is an entire CB3. I actually prefer to see a bill that just 
you know, allowed 24 seven or even did 24 seven cameras everywhere. That's me. So I'm, I'm trying to imagine what kind of opposition there could be to that. But rather than imagine it, because I'm not really imagining that there's any legitimate reason or honorable reason, what is the opposition to doing that? Why have you created this, this um, sort of a compromise? I, I guess also I'll say with term limits at some point when those kick in, community boards are gonna start forgetting all of these wonderful options that they have, um, unless activists um, or you know, good elected officials keep reminding them to request these good things, they'll, they'll, they'll go out of fashion. So anyway, I guess, what is the opposition to just doing it 24 seven? Yeah, I guess, uh, you know, the, the New York legislature is, I guess, um, diverse and it's, uh, it's not just us who, who, you know, are trying to work on positive uh, traffic policy, but um, some upstate folks, I, you know, I'm, I'm actually not in um, entirely sure what arguments they're making, but I do know that there's kind of a general opposition to, to growing the, from some folks from growing the, the speed camera program. So I guess, um, you know, we, these bills are pretty new. Uh, so we're still on the initial steps of get, getting support for them. And, and like I said, we do have the blanket 24 seven bill and then the, the furious act. Um, and, you, you know, it, we, we are open to feedback from the community and, um, you know, what, what types of um, fixes are, are you guys see as best. So we, we'd love to, to hear what you guys think is the best approach, but uh, that's just kind of strategically, that's kind of why we, uh, we did, we took that path, but um yeah, I guess I guess it's it's just not not everybody wants the expansion of the program, I guess. But um, okay, I, I mean, specific. I, upstate, downstate, got it. So it's not people concerned about surveillance. I mean, given that they're doing it from ten to six, twenty four seven is not any worse. Okay, the other thing I guess now is um, how difficult would it be for a community board to get it done for the whole community board? I mean, generally we're plagued by congestion. But speeding is worse, especially since the speed limit is 30 in a heavily populated urban area. Um, can we just have a hearing and say, because it's 30 miles per hour um, and that'll kill people, uh, we want the cameras turned on in our area. Would that just do it? Um, or is there someone who's gonna evaluate what we've said and we're gonna have to learn how to convince them? So there, the way that's written, it, there needs to be kind of some um, some evidence of of the um, of these types of incidents, like the racing happening. So, you know, there's the three on one complaints and things of that nature. Could be, uh, the, I mean, during the big beginning of the pandemic, there's a few really high profile like crashes of people racing. Um, things like that would would kind of build the case, and then. And then you you would basically have to convince the board to pass the resolution um, in order to to have that take effect. The board, like CB three, would pass it. I think we would pass it unanimously. Yeah. Okay. So then, so then if if the board. Mm -hmm. So yeah, you would just you would just need to pass the resolution uh, citing some of these incidents. Uh, and uh, and that would allow, um, and you would have to have a public hearing uh, on the issue, and then that would allow the the cameras to be turned on. Okay. Um, Michelle, and then Lee. Lee, I see your hand, Michelle. Thanks, first. Thanks Paul. Um, so I'm going to make an educated guess about who's against these, and it's drivers because they don't want to get ticketed. Um, there are states that have outlawed red light cameras, um, even though they've been proven to reduce crashes as well as injuries and deaths, um, and they act as speed deterrents, but I'm going to make a guess it's, it's motorists um, and the advocacy organizations for motorists and potentially even police unions who want to protect, have protectionist job um, feelings. Those are my guesses. Um, so, but I want to echo David's 
thing. I don't even know if speeding is the worst problem here. Um, we have lots of other, I mean, it's definitely an issue because there are motorists that will speed, but I think we just have such a more comprehensive traffic problem here. So um, I, I wonder if there is, because like, I don't, I don't know if anyone else has heard like the drag racing, but I have not heard that here. And I lived on Delancey Street throughout all of COVID. So um, uh, you would think that might be one place where they'd be doing it. Um, but we just have so many other issues. So I'm wondering, Sam, if you know of other besides like red lights and speeding, other enforcement actions that these cameras can do? Like, cause we have like lots of illegal turns happening, um, turning from like turning again, like there's like places where you can't make a left turn that people are making left turns. Yeah. You have people making left turns out of the wrong lane. Um, you have people parking in places that they're not supposed to park. I know that I had heard that, that Margaret Forgione had been, the, you know, the acting or the former acting DOT commissioner in New York was talking about cameras for, for bike lanes. So I'm sort of curious if you've explored other ways that these cameras can be used beyond just um, speeding and red lights, because those are, I, I have a PowerPoint I put together. I presented in December about all the part, like, issues in our district or present, uh, more like the Lower East Side, but um, at least down here, I don't know if speeding is the main issue. Mm -hmm. So I'm just curious if you have like done research into other ways that these cameras can be used for enforcement. The, you know, we, you know, we, we see these, this law is just kind of like another tool for the city to address some of the broader issues. And, and you're right. It's not every area is the same and, uh, and, and is experiencing different traffic issues. So you know, we, we're trying to give the city more tools to, to be able to achieve vision zero and, and you know, make, make streets safer. Um, we haven't really looked at if these cameras can be used for other infractions. I know like they're automated, so it's not like someone is, is like monitoring to see if someone's doing an illegal turn. I don't know if they would be, if they have the technical ability to detect when someone's doing an illegal turn I know that it, the speed is just like, I believe it's just a radar. So it just knows when you're going past the speed limit. So I don't know if they have cameras that could detect turns like that. Um, that would be interesting to see. Um, yeah, I would ask if you could, if you're if you're looking at ways to modify your bills, that if you could look into that as like a technological possibility, because I imagine that there's a, I know that yours are not red light cameras, but that's my understanding is the other type of camera enforcement is red lights. So I don't know if that's like tied to the red light or if it's a, a camera, you know, that like can see at a certain time or whatever. So that might be another way to do the turns. I'm not a not a traffic engineer, but just I would ask for yeah. you to, to consider that as you look at your bills. Okay, definitely. Um, yeah, thank you. All right, go ahead, Lee. So actually uh, going back to, to red lights, Sam, is, is the placement and number of red lights, is that a state issue or is that a city um, controlled issue, Do you know? Of, of red lights the red light cameras so these, these are speed cameras um so i'm this is that i'm not sure about about uh red light cameras i don't know if, if we have those um i'm actually not certain sorry but so this legislation covers speed cameras um and they are they are placed in in school zones yeah and um and so the, the legislation just authorizes the city. Uh, so then the implementation is actually done by DOT. Okay, then, then maybe I, I see Jennifer uh, is on the call. Maybe we can ask her um, right after this because I certainly see the need for additional, well, first of all, absolutely for speed cameras, but red light cameras as well. Um, I know I, uh, we've got a bunch of dummy red light cameras uh, around the community. And oh, if only those were turned on, uh, what a revenue generator, but hopefully also a disincentive to run red lights. Um, the other thing is, does the Furious Act cover um, the, the new phenomenon that came out about, about a year and a half ago about um, cars that sound like cannons or farting cars? Uh, I live near the FDR Drive and we hear that all day, all night. And, and certainly the people who have modified their cars uh, illegally to, to sound like they're firing cannons, certainly don't care about speeding uh, either. So is, is that one of the noise uh, concerns covered by 
the Furious Act? So the 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 Furious Act um, does not cover that. Um, um, but you know there was there was um, around the same time there was some of our colleagues uh, did introduce legislation uh, on that issue. Um, I don't have that in front of me. That was in our office, but um, I know that there was a few kind of high profile incidents that kind of prompted our office and some other offices to um, to look at legislating in this in among like the the speeding and the and the the noise that was happening um and i know that there was someone legislating around like the mu uh, the muffler adjustments and stuff like that but i uh that wasn't us so unfortunately i don't have that in front of me but i i could try to see if um if i could pull that up and find something but yeah and, and i would hope that brad would certainly if he hasn't already if he would sign on to that uh, of course yeah knowledge. Um, you know, noise pollution is is one of the mm -hmm. um, major concerns in the community as well. Thank you. Definitely. Uh, Jennifer, I believe you're on from DOT. Um, Lee had a question about that 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 red light camera. If if you would be able to answer that for him, please. I won't be able to, but I'll bring it back. But I do believe that red light cameras and speed cameras are under the same category. I mean, red light cameras are essentially, you know, when obviously you run a red light, it is you speeding. So I think they're very similar, but I have to find out from my folks if it's under the same legislation or not. Great, thank you. Thank you. Yep. All right, does the committee have any other questions for uh, Sam? No, that's it. Well, I'll just say, you know, in spite of my being very negative of four, this is great. Get what you can get. Thank you. Home rule. All right. Okay. Um, and if you guys have any any feedback that you'd like to send our way, you know, we're we're happy to to collect it and and make changes where where appropriate. So feel free to to reach back out and stay in touch if, if anything else comes up. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sam, for coming on tonight. Um, on short notice, I know we got this done pretty quickly. Thank you, Susan, for putting that together. Uh, yeah, thank you. So hopefully you take this back and uh, whatever support you need from us, please let us know down the line. And I'm sure we'll, we want cameras everywhere. Let's just put it that way. You know, let's just take pictures, speeds, cam, everything, turns. We want the whole thing. Thanks, All right. Sam. All right. Thank Thanks, Sam. All right. That will conclude that agenda item for tonight. All right. The undercard is over, and now the main event is about to start because we have a huge resolution, potential resolution in front of us uh, in terms of the open restaurants and open streets restaurants program. So one thing that's kind of been uh, thorn in our side for the past several months since the pandemic has happened is this whole lack of enforcement uh, on these programs, who's doing what. We had that town hall uh, about a month ago where um, we felt more confused after we left, after we left the town hall. So we have a pretty lengthy resolution we'd like to look at tonight. Um, and what I want to do is start by putting the resolution to the floor and look through it or whereas by whereas there's a lot of questions i know i sent out one version of it on sunday during the super bowl um if any of you were watching and then i sent a second one out yet last night um which is very similar in content just a little it was just a more cleaned up version uh this is going to take a little while uh so anybody want to make a motion to bring that resolution to the floor and I will take public comment at some point during this portion. Anybody want to make a motion? There you go, Lee. Let, 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 Second. Let's do it. There we go. Let's pull that bad boy up. All right. Michelle, did I send it to you? Did I send you the new one? All right. 
All right. Gloves. Okay. So this is pretty lengthy. It's about what, five, five and a half, six pages. Um, a lot of his content. And the resolution is really based off of everything we heard at the town hall, anything that's been a complaint made to the office, anything that Susan and the office has, have picked up. Um, I know we just got to fix up some of the structural issues. I think it just sent out weird from my laptop last night. Um, so I do want to start <laughs> and can we order the chili vinegar or no? Is that part of it? No, that was supposed to only share the, um, hold on. Let me try this again. It's supposed to only share the document, not my whole desktop. I don't want you to see my text messages. Hold on. Oh, <laughs> that sounds interesting. Uh, that might be the better. Yeah. Way. Like, hold on. yeah, it's probably about like kind of telling my, my boyfriend to stop making so much noise behind me, but besides that, that's okay. <laughs> Hold on, here we go, here we go. I shared desktop too instead of resolution, okay. There we go. <laughs> All right, let's scroll up to the top. Um, let me... Paul, do you want maybe to give a little background about the legislation that was passed and everything? Sure, you wanna talk about, was it law 114? Um, so I think Paul sent out to everyone legislation that has already been voted on and passed by city council. And that legislation says that when the current open dining expires in September, 2021, it's gonna be replaced by permanent open dining. However, the details of what that open dining looks like is still to be uh, voted on in city council. So this would speak to being able to testify in city council on the rules and regulations of making open dining permanent. And also the permanent open dining does not close any streets for dining. What it allows is um, the curbside use of the roadbed and that's it. All right, thank you, Susan. Um, so yeah, the, the law is passed correctly, correct? Um, yeah. So you know, we, we can't beat that to death or anything like that. Why did they pass it or all this stuff? We, we gotta play with the information we have available to us. So how do we get our voice heard on this going forward, especially when this does switch up over in uh, September of 2021? Okay, so I think the first two whereases are pretty standard. Uh, pretty pretty simple, and maybe the, the top three. Um, actually, the third one, maybe, uh, David, you had a question, right, about they? The third whereas, using they unclearly? Yeah, but, you know, I don't know if you want to pick through it like that. Is it it's the third bullet point under, under something? It's no longer in the third whereas. I commented on a previous draft for everyone, and so there's a few comments okay. that Paul's going to ask about. But I think um, I don't see anything in this third. Whereas, I, I think I know what you're talking about. Um, but most of it, there's it's in that fifth. Whereas, they have proven to be a benefit, and they have exposed many problems. You know, it's just a, a readability thing. But really, it's the uh, the the program has proved a benefit to many eating right. establishments, and it has become clear that there are many problems that need to be remedied. Something like that. The 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 we, we just got to be clearer on the language instead of just yeah, saying. Yeah, well, we don't have to, but if you did, then the programs. Um, well, this it has is pretty lengthy. Clearer than the it's pretty lengthy. This one was really minor, by the way. What? As the... Okay. Sure. There was no clear antecedent. That's all, Susan. Pardon? There was not a clear antecedent. This is good now. Well, I was saying, if we're going to do a resolution, it's good to have it clear. So thank you. Okay. Well, all right. All right. <laughs> yeah, I'm reading your email now, David. I'm reading through it, so I'm going to just tee you up on each point that you made. Okay. Uh, um, okay. So we got that one out of the way. Uh, the following have been identified. You said. 
right? Whereas on the point uh, five, you said. Oh, it, it's it's now there. It starts with a whereas. There were like, yeah, it, whereas it's, following it's the, it's the big lineup. It's the big lineup of items. Right, right, right. Okay. And then there was a comment on about three of these points of these uh, numeral numerated points. All right, so you want to look at this is, a, this is a fabulous resolution, by the way, I think um, I, I did read it very carefully. Um, I think it has captured um, a lot of things that, that need to be dealt with, with concrete suggestions. And I know that the office had a, a lot to do with that. And um, it was also, you know, the, the, the public hearing, I, um, you know, we heard a lot at that public hearing. I know people Incomplete sentence. I'm not going to complete it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, all right. I was just, I was eager with anticipation right there. I wanted to hear what you were going to finish off, but all right. Um, let's go down to that. Was I'm looking. I'm going to like tee you up on the point. So okay. said point five. If you want to scroll down. There's jurisdiction. There's rules. There's community input. And there's so under enforcement. I don't know. It's been reworded now, and it's I I had suggested language that would use the phrase unfair competitive advantage. And it was about, uh, you know, when one business is following all the rules, which reduce their business and increase their expenses and other businesses are ignoring it and no one's enforcing, the city creates an unfair competitive advantage, which is sort of a legal concept uh, for, you know, so that there's an un unfair competitive advantage for the regulation breaker. Uh, but, but it's actually very good as written. So I don't think that it's worth pursuing. The sentence is now clearer, and I don't think it would benefit by trying to rephrase it. It says, okay. uh, "I think it was where good that. actors complying with regulations suffer from limited business compared to neighboring businesses that do not comply with guidelines for etc." It's a completely rephrased sentence, and it's a good one. We could put in that sentence you gave could follow that that line right there. This creates an unfair competitive advantage yes. I think that for the uh, businesses that break regulations. Yeah, I think it without would emphasize yeah. it. I think yeah, that 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 do not obey regulations um, uh, without how to say it because they're not done enforcement's not happening without consequences of enforcement in the absence of enforcement. In the absence of enforcement, right? Do not obey the regulations in advance. In a uh, advance of, of enforcement, usually unfair competitive advantage is used for things like where businesses are doing monopolistic practices and so forth. Uh, but this is the city that's creating the situation. So I like the sentence. Thank you. It's getting better and better. I'm gonna keep. I'm gonna keep chipping away at your email now, though. Does anybody have any object uh, object to that? I think that's fine. That addition. Uh, that you said 0.7, the three minor word changes. Did they were they changed up? They look like they were changed up, changed up on the um an outdoor and amplified app. music. Yeah. Oh, is it can we scroll to it? Okay. Yeah. I should refer back to my email, Paul. I right, I'll read it for you. How about that? There you go. In point okay. seven, there are three minor word changes that will help readability. Add the word were to read seed. Seat customers as if they were outdoors. All right, but I don't see it in here anymore. Is it in seven anymore? Social distancing. Up, oh, yep. That's a, as if they were outdoors. It's already here. But I previously, yeah, whatever. Next one. It's add of now. add of capacity to read. Do not limit to twenty five percent of capacity. Right, twenty five percent. I I know that's a reference to the. Capacity is defined by the, you know, indoor, uh, what do they call it, CFO. So 25% capacity just makes it a little clear what we're referring to. Yes, absolutely. Okay. And the next one is uh, change trace records to something like records <sighs> for contact tracing. Yeah. Those are all shorthand and they're still shorthand, but maybe it's a little clearer, not too many words, okay. All right, so now I'm going to go to point 10, which might be something different. This is an attempt to rescue small business in a health emergency, so it might be nine or 10. Uh, 
oh, this was a point about, okay, this whole list is prefaced at the top by saying, these are things that are of immediate concern and must be addressed. But it mm -hmm. also, as Susan was saying, there's a, there's gonna be a result, further result at the very end that says these things need to be considered for the permanent uh, program. Well, this one actually, it's been totally reworded. Uh, but anyway, I guess the point still stands. The question still stands, do we have an opinion about how this should be handled for permanent program? It did say that you know, flexibility is in the interest of, uh, because of the, because of COVID emergency flexibility. Which one was it in? Are you talking about this number 10 private use of public space? Where do we talk about, yeah, about mass transit facilities? Um, oh, let me pull it up on my end. What do you mean? Uh, essentially, we felt that there should be more flexibility so that people who have like a bike rack or uh, some other transportation infrastructure at their location mm -hmm. that prevent use of the street bed, can we have some flexibility in the time of COVID? Do we intend that flexibility to be there for the uh, permanent program as well was my question. It's number nine, Michelle. It looks like flexibility yeah, of use of oh, space. Whoops, there you go. Right. It, it's okay. number nine and um, you know, that's kind of a new issue that the resolution doesn't weigh in on. And I think, I think people at town hall brought up, um, or maybe not. Yes, so if there's a process. People right. have brought up the issue a lot, but no one has given a overall resolution. You know, it should be addressed. I mean, it's terrible if someone is at a location that they're now going to be, you know, limited uh, in, for this opportunity. Very I mean, overall, I have questions yeah. about whether we should be should be using the the the, the curb lane. Well, that's already in, in, in this law. in this way. I understand that, but given that they're doing it, they should be doing it equitably, and we shouldn't have. Yeah, we also. Well. It, it's a very, very difficult ish, issue to address. For instance, if there is a loading lane that the businesses need and you can't put tables there, it is unfair to the business. Yep. But how do you how do you right. resolve that? Right. I guess that's the larger question, Paul, have you gone through my minor like readability points? And do we want to open up general discussion or I'm gonna let you drive? Uh, we can open up for discussion if you, if you don't want me to go through any more of your points. Because I think your final point is going towards the resolve clauses. Okay, well, scroll down to them because I'm, like I said, don't remember my email. Okay, actually before, I'm sorry, Michelle, can you just scroll up to nine again? I just saw something uh, where it says compete on a fair plane. Can you change plane, P-L-A-I-N to P-A-L-A-N-E? I'm a terrible speller. Which one is the right one? I think it's I think it's mine. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I think the other I've one. I've never just, seen that. Shouldn't it, oh. that's a that was a weird. It's just like a weird phrase. Yeah. Yeah. Let's just change that whole thing. Can we say on a level playing field or something like that. There you go. Yes, that's, that's exactly. The, that's please. a metaphor. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I have a question. Has anyone talked about if we're, oh, oh, sorry, do we have more David things? No, 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 no. general discussion. Go ahead, Michelle. Um, has anyone looked at how um, other cities that have um, outdoor, like like European cities that have more substantial outdoor dining structures do this? Like I was in Belgrade and they have it, they have it in Paris. Like they don't, I feel like New York is one of the few truly global cities that has like such restrictions on outdoor dining. Um, I'm just wondering if there has been any like examination of how they do it. Like with, I saw, you know, like in here we have about like charging, you know, et cetera. So I'm just wondering, Susan, I see your hand up. Go ahead, Susan, we see. 
Um, so that's a, one really good way to help resolve it. What I would like to suggest is there is no way we can decide tonight on how you resolve that issue because for one thing, we don't even know the different possible options. And what I would like to suggest is maybe adding something. You're making me dizzy though. <laughs> You're Sorry, it, it says that there are 19 items. I only see 18, so. That's because I think the 19 was before it was rewritten. Um, okay. What I would like to suggest is that what we put in there is what we want to see happen, which would be um, a process created to uh, eliminate these in inequities. Because it's, it's a really complicated technical thing. There's no way we even know the issues to, to attack them, but we want the people with expertise to give us um, to give options on how to do it. Where would you recommend putting that? In in that same, in that same, um, that same pair, um, section that we were. What was it? Number nine. Flexible use of space. Yeah, flexibility. Say um, currently, there is not a process to deal to. Um, I'm just saying the words. We can figure out to deal with these inequities, but the permanent plan um, must provide options um, so that um, so the exceptions to guidelines can be made um, where necessary for businesses to compete fairly. David, did you want to say something on this or something separate? Um, well, I mean, it's another point overall. So I'll hold. All right. That seems all right. If Yes, Susan. I was just going to say, I happened to actually just find out today that, you know, the issue was brought up at the town hall about public spaces being made private. And that actually is what's happening. You have a public roadway, but when a business puts a structure in that roadway, it is a private stru a structure and belongs to the business. Um, one of the issues that came up was you know homeless person people are have the right to be in public space but that's a private structure so it's no longer a public space uh for you know it can become trespassing mm. and that's why you're seeing the tape and the ropes around the structures when they're empty because if you go if they're roped off or taped off and then someone goes in them, that's then legally trespassing. It's very complicated. It's not right. There's gonna be some awful unintended consequences of all of this. It's moving way too quickly. Well, I mean, nobody is making any arrests or doing anything like that. At, at no, this. no, but the, the permanent program is gonna create Situations. I was just thinking about that because I I, I work in within CB two and I see one of some of their restaurants have all well, their stuff still out, but there's homeless within the structures. They're sleeping within in them. Like there was like a, there was like a whole encampment the other day. I was like, wow, okay. And that, that's how they were staying warm. It was, it was, it was a sight to see, to be honest. I, I well, haven't yeah, seen our, it. Our, our I, piece I should not be that they're in there, but the beef should be that we have for we have yeah. created public policies that makes it so that they have, that's the only place where they can seek shelter. So. Yeah. This was. But that's in here, their consideration. Oh, it's sorry. Is there a clearly articulated policy around the rights of individuals, right? Susan, that's what you're referring to? Um, 
Yeah, I mean, basically, because it came up in, in the town hall and, you know, what happens if you're not making public spaces private, you know, how, to, how is the public compensated for that? David, you, had, you said you had a separate point? Yeah, so um, as I can tie it into the question about other cities, when I've, you know, in, in the older cities in Europe, generally they're not square grids and you've got like plazas that happen and most of outdoor dining tends to be in these plazas that become destinations. Um, in newer cities, like in the US, um, like where I came from, generally these outdoor seating areas are on private property. Also the street grid is not a, not a square grid there. Um, so it's you know, more varied in any case. The bad thing that is happening here, and it's on my block, uh, is an example. Uh, there's like six bars in a row, right, on a residential street. Um, it's like the first oversaturated zone that uh, was defined in CB3. It's all on one side of the street. They're all in a row, and it's a gauntlet. They have created a party that lasts for six buildings. Um, and I didn't even know this. I'd seen that there were fights because I would hear them across the street and it's a resident coming down furious. They're at the end of their rope and there's a, basically a fight happening. I don't you know if it came to blows, but it's really bad. Now, the other night, it was a Friday night. It was a uh, beautiful weather. It was like, you know, warmer than my refrigerator outdoors and people were out in droves. And I bumped into a friend and I walked her I walked back to her apartment on her side of the street. It was terrible. Um, and that was when it was like 42 degrees out. When it's like 72 degrees out, and this is a permanent program, that end of the block is um, unlivable. Um, and that's what the city is creating by doing this program. I, I, I really honestly believe that. Now, I, I love repurposing, you know, the street bed, which is excessive in New York City, um, you know, for public purposes, but I, I really fear what they are gonna create in, in areas where there are, you know, six liquor licenses in a row. And it's not like the liquor licenses are gonna go away, you know, with all my neighbors buying their toilet paper online, you know, something's gotta go into to those uh, storefronts. I don't know if we can address it in here, but this is, this is uh, what's gonna happen. Is there, is there something that we can put in here about like um, prioritizing? I mean, this came up during the open, this came up during the, um, during the, the town hall like that. And I brought it up too. It's like this, we've forced a false dichotomy between sidewalk space for restaurants and sidewalk space for pedestrians when we've got this nice asphalt that is only for drivers that, you know, so can we, Put something in here like you know looking at repurposing streets wherever possible or something Susan. can i say something david's street is extremely unusual because most all of those businesses are, are not compliant with the zoning those are all non-compliant grandfathered businesses and so it's a, a new which um, happens a lot in in the East Village and not so much in New York City. So that, that's not really the fact that it's worse because it's on a residential side street, but that is not happening in that manner in most of the city. Um, I would just also, you know, in making the additions, you know, are we, I would kind of differentiate between getting into philosophy and getting what them you want them to do with this program that's already passed you know what do you want to focus because paul you said you were gonna you intended to have quite a few different resolutions addressing different situations so what i'm wondering is if you want to talk more about policy do you want to do that in a, a different resolution yeah. the point in here about uh, noise and amplified sound I would suggest there should be, COVID is different, but there should be no amplified sound. One of those businesses is Club Coming, which has actually turned out to be a really wonderful business, but they're doing their performances outside on a very large screen uh, with um, 
quite amplified sound. I can stand across the street and watch a performance. Uh, this that's cannot all, happen in normal times. That's all illegal and it will continue to be illegal, but no one's reported it. This is the first I've heard. It's illegal. They, you're not allowed to have amplified sound on the sidewalk and the new open culture legislation also does not allow amplified sound outside. Okay, so it's, it's a lack of enforcement situation. Outside no period, reported, not even. Yes, nobody's reported it, David. Uh, okay, it's, it's not a problem for me. It's a problem for all my neighbors that, yeah, okay. Ask, ask. so I, can I tell so you- um, fights in, instead in of reporting area, it is what's happening. In this area, both the council office and the community board have a tremendous amount of complaints about outside amplified sound. We are able to address some of them. So if they send us the complaints, it is totally illegal, but um, it's complaint driven. Uh, Ellen, you have your hand up. Hey, I um, just want to piggyback on the discussion about streets and, and the construction of streets. And, and, you know, I think for lower Manhattan, just because of, you know, it being having older neighborhoods, the streets really are not the same, right, as other parts of Manhattan, for example. So I think that creates and compounds a, a more limiting effect, right, and compounds a negative impact where you have a much smaller constrained narrow space that is shared by an even more greater number of people, which increases the free ridership dilemma, right? So that means that, you know, you have more public space that benefits the, pub the private um, aspect of things as opposed to public space for the public benefit. Well, I think this is, when when you say lower manhattan what do you what are you defining that as well i think just because of the way that new york was created the lower parts of manhattan and the way that it's constructed especially around this community board the streets are much more narrowly constructed right as opposed to other parts of upper mid or mid manhattan right or even other outer borough streets the sidewalks are not the same. It's like the historic, the historic core of Chinatown is one of those areas. And then down, you know, in the Wall Street area, there's still remnants of the old, like Stone Street, oh, for instance. Is that what you're I'm, talking about, those kinds of areas? I think I'm, just, I'm just recognizing that the streets and the sidewalks are narrower, for example. I, I, think, I think that's true, but I think um, there are, in Chinatown, there has been some protests about it, but it's, it's been largely, um, I think, really, um, you know, been positive. There's been a lot of um, positive feedback about that. I think about maybe because it is so, maybe because it, it is so um, narrow and people are able to use the streets more, for even for pedestrians. Well, my point here is that the streets are, the sidewalks and streets are narrower and now you have more competition for those same spaces that benefit the public as opposed to benefiting, I mean, benefiting private endeavors as opposed to benefiting the public, right? So it's not like there's a reduction of public space. There's just more competition for that same public space. And but recognizing people, that not all streets and sidewalks are constructed the same. I think you're absolutely right, but the public is not talking and get, they're not um, commenting negatively on it. You know, if we're going by the complaints we've received, those are not the complaints that we've, you know, received about that. Well, I, 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 my, think, my fear is, my I, fear is I, that I, we I, can't make a decision for, for areas where people have not said this is a problem. Oh, I think we can. I, I think we can trust I, I don't our own know observations. Anyone who doesn't yeah, think, think that that's an issue, especially walking down certain parts of Moss Street, it's, it's, a, it's a literal comp competition in terms of which lane and you know which narrow like one person with you're walking because as people are trying to conduct business outside, waiters going back and forth on the same sidewalk 
right? People are waiting, people are walking down. And if you're, um, you, if you have limited mobility, if you are in a wheelchair, it's really hard. You literally have to roll over people in order to really have a straight line down the sidewalk. That's true. The um, mobility issues, I think, are really serious. And, you know, I just, if I'm, you, I, regardless of, you know, you may be right that there are people that haven't been complaining but still feel that way. But I don't know how we would address that because this is a citywide thing. So I don't know. I mean, it's, it might be a separate issue to take up. Um, I don't know how one would address it here for a citywide program. And one, Jen, is Jennifer still on? She's not still on, is she? Yeah, I, I see her. Jennifer, is I'm there is there any way of looking like, um, say, core of Chinatown? Is there any way of looking at that differently? Um, I don't have an answer to that, but I will ask if there's some, you know, if there's something we can take a look at because, you know, based on what I'm hearing, I do agree with you. Um, Chinatown is very different in the way how the streets are laid out. Um, like I said, um, I will have to bring it back and uh, see if there's any way to look at it differently. Okay, thank you. All right, yep. thank you. Um, so going back to what you were saying, Susan, there, there are gonna be parts that I, I figure we're gonna end up writing out a bunch of resolutions, like something like that could end up being something we put on as a specific agenda item. Um, but I just wanna tackle the this, this whole large one yeah. today yeah. before we start smashing out little pieces of this uh, program each month um, and try to uh, form resolutions around that. So yeah, no, eventually we'll go after policy. Right now, we just wanted to get all the community concerns and put it all into one resolution uh, for this month so we can move from there. I could say that's a great idea because if you put it on as a separate agenda item that people will come and speak to it. Right. So if there's specific complaints coming to the office about something very, very specific, noise, whatever, then we can focus on that as opposed to this one giant thing, right? Which we are, yeah. which is going to be our, I guess our thesis statement, um, something that's going to let us uh, get our voice heard with this law. All right. So how many how many num numerical items do we have now after the cleanup? Was it 18 or 19? I think Michelle said it was 18. I only counted 18. Okay. So we need to, yeah, so I probably- I changed it. it the awesome. So let's- um, There again, in the, in the, the one that the thir first further resolve is all this is nice. Okay, um, bef before I look at the results, let me scroll, can we scroll back up to the uh, bullets, the one through 18? Um, all right, so we got jurisdiction. You, just, you keep scrolling, I'm just gonna read through. Jurisdiction, rules, regs, community input, the complaint process, enforcement, social distancing, outdoor and amplified music, roving entertainment, Flexibility of use of space, private use of public space, abandoned structures, unpermitted permanent structures, uh, severe weather, electrical work and flaming heating elements, or flammable heating elements, sidewalk obstructions and accessibility, consolidation and ease of access to guidelines, sanitation, emergency vehicle access, and safety for first responders. Like I, I can see out of those 18 items that we can almost pick apart each item as a separate agenda item going down the line over the next few months or a couple of agenda items or different resolutions. So that being said, with those 18 that we just kind of, that kind of just flew through and what you have in your emails, uh, is there anything that we're missing? <laughs> to be honest, I, I'm, I'm I'm being serious. I'll, I'll even ask that. I don't even know if there's that many mem members of the community on right now. I think a lot of them dropped off. Um, even if the members of the community have is there anything specifically missing from this thing that we may have forgotten to put in from 
the town hall or any previous conversations we've had. And this is only limited to the open streets and open streets restaurant. I mean, open restaurants and open streets restaurants program. That's what it's limited to. Is there anything we're missing? I don't think, I, Susan, I really think you and Jim covered everything. I really I, do think you did. Well, I also went through the, I, I cheat. I went through community board two resolution after their meetings and, um, you know, so you cheated. I cheated. Uh, but I told him, I sent him an email and said I was copying. Don't reinvent the wheel. I agree. No need. What? what? No. All right. Can okay. I uh, can I call a question on this? Uh, didn't David have something about re resolution, the resolve clauses or no? No, it, it was I think it was the number. I saw that the number in 18. Yeah, it? I changed that. Yeah. You said call the question, Michelle? I call them, I'm calling the question. I don't want to make dinner. <laughs> so, so a couple of us here were on a meeting till 10 p.m. last night. So Paul, do you know what to do at this point? With a call uh, the question? Do you know what was it? We're, we're, I'm, I'm, I'm lost right now. Yeah, it's been a you ask, you, if a majority of the, there's no debate on this, but if a there's majority no of the committee agrees that I'm we sorry. don't want to debate any longer, then we can vote on the on the actual resolution. So you can just ask, does anyone feel the need to continue debating? Most likely nobody says so, but if, if someone does, then you have to take a vote on whether right. to go to a vote. <laughs> I knew that was the next answer. Thank you. If a majority of people want to continue debating, then we continue debating. Otherwise we stop. So anybody want to continue debating? Anybody have anything else that they want to add? Is that a, a no in unison? That's what it sounds like. All right, there's a thumbs down in there. Okay. All right, so we'll move. I guess we can move this to a vote. When, Wendy, I know you're, uh, you're still on, right? Let's, yes, are we uh, connected? So, so, yeah, okay, good. Um, let's uh, get a vote on this resolution. Okay, Paul? Yes. Michelle? Yes. Oh. Wendy, yes. Uh, Lee Berman? Yes. David? Yes. Alicia? She's not on. Okay. Ellen? <clears throat> is Tariq on as well? Tariq is not on. Okay, gotcha. Thank you very much. All right. So could I ask, you know, since you mentioned you want to put other things on the agenda, um, is it possible to say what those things are now, um, if they're from here for next month? And, you know, we can capture them to make sure I can, you know, that I, I get them on the agenda successfully. Well, uh, I, I think, you know, I think Ellen brought something up. It was pretty, Chinatown. Um, if we could put that on the agenda, I, 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 that, okay. that's a, that's a legit concern. That's a, you know, not, not a legit concern, but it's definitely a concern. And, Especially so, with the way those streets are set up. So maybe we'll bring DOT back with that. If we could just I'm just give me a, a better idea of the language. Um, uh, something about um, I'm, I'm gonna say is how does China how does the core of Chinatown um, fit into open dining, but we need better wording, you know, something like that, but a better wording than that. It's also other areas like 7th Street up in our area yes. is like super narrow. But I think so we want to specifically look at Chinatown as an area, right? You can look yeah. at other areas, but you want to, we're looking at China. Chinatown is one we're looking at, right? Yeah. So if, um, if, could you help me just a little bit with the language? Sure. Let me, I'm trying to write it out on a notebook. Uh, Planning, maybe planning for the core of Chinatown in the outdoor dining program. How's that? If you, if you phrase it with a such as, I'll be much happier. Blah, 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 blah. Such as Chinatown and East 7th Street. Because it is more than just Chinatown that has that situation. Um, and then you would draw in people from 7th Street, perhaps, as well. 
so how would, and again, we have Jennifer Leung on here, how would the program, would they exempt certain specific streets um, because they're narrow? Is that what the plan would be? Because, um, I mean, I don't understand how you're gonna make a city program that way. I could see exempting like a specific area like Chinatown, but if you start saying this street here and that street there, I don't know how that- Or the sidewalks works. are under four foot wide, how's that? I mean, something like that, that's the situation on 7th Street. You can't even get a baby carriage down that sidewalk as it is. So and that would businesses. be a separate item then, um, outdoor dining in areas where sidewalks of less than four feet. There we go. Okay, so Something that's like that, four, idea. eight foot, but narrow sidewalks is, yeah, correct. Yeah, narrow sidewalks. I'm not sure how we're gonna write the footage. Uh, right. Because each street is different, so. Maybe so narrow. We're gonna have to come with some criteria because you can't have like a different guideline for every street. So, I mean, if you're going to say narrow sidewalks, or, you know, at some point feet. you have to say, well, yeah, not, you don't have to do it for the agenda item, but at some point we're going to okay. have to say, what do we mean by that? Okay. Right. So that's two, that's two agenda items for this program. Okay. And then, yeah. then how about the one that Michelle brought up about, um, or do, do we want to, um, I, I don't even know how to do it, but consider options for flexible space. All right, so we have, we have the narrow sidewalks item. What's the second one I'm thinking? Um, second one second? is the core of Chinatown. Okay. And then I think the, the other one I, that I heard mentioned was, um, you know, options for flexible spaces. So that options, would be like streetways. Flexible. Yeah. What'd you say, Michelle? I didn't hear. Like street, using the streets more, like not making this uh, about only about sidewalks. And okay, so I know it was already part of the program, but just being flexible about what public spaces. Okay, that's, that's about in the same family. Okay, yeah, let's put that on. And it gives us three items. Yeah, let's cap it at that. Okay. Is there anything else that you wanted to have on the agenda that you can think of right now? Although Jennifer, I don't know if Jennifer is going to be, DOT is going to be putting anything on. This DOT, yeah. Jen? Um, I don't know at the moment. I would need to check. I think we could be uh, coming to you with something, but let me check. I'll get back to you this week. Also, we, we had been asking about um, to get information about the new pilots unloading, neighborhood loading and loading and unloading zone plans. Mm -hmm. uh, let me check with that team because I think uh, sometime in the spring, I think they were going to come to some of the community groups to present on that. But let me find out what's their status at the moment. Okay, thank you. All right. Um, yeah, let's cap it at three, just in case there's that next item from DOT as well. Uh, when would that, that meeting will be March 9th as well, right, Susan? Um, I think that's right. I have a, I don't have March it. usually lines up with February. Okay. okay. Um, all right. So that brings us to the end of our night. Um, let's do our final attendance and then, then we can adjourn. So one day just our final attendance at the front for our final vote and then we can adjourn. Okay. Uh, Paul? Yes. Michelle? Yes. Wendy? Yes. Lee? Yes. David? Here. Felicia still absent. Ellen? Yes. And Tariq is absent as well. Thank Those you very absent. much. Thank you, Wendy. All right, thank you, everyone. Um, I don't need a motion to adjourn. Uh, we are adjourned for the night. Have, I will see everyone next month or at full board. Good night. Thanks, Paul.
Thank you.